Leto Atreides II, God Emperor, Worm God. Latros II Atreides, the central character of the Dune Cycle, is a complex and enigmatic figure that captivates readers with his mysterious and unsettling presence. From a very young age, Leto made a courageous decision to renounce his humanity and embrace a new form of existence, transforming his body with the skin of a sand trout, a creature revered by the Fremen. This was something that completely changed the Dune universe for better or for worse. But there's a lot more to the character, and this introduction won't suffice, so let's get to exploring, shall we? Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. Exploring the early life of Leto Atreides II, the hot, arid planet of Arrakis was an unforgiving wasteland of sand and heat, where life was scarce, and survival was a constant battle, but it was also home to one of the most valuable resources in the galaxy, Spice Melange, and it was here that Leto II and his twin sister Ganima were born to a mother who would never get to see them grow up. They were very different from other children of their age because of their mother, Cheney's overconsumption of the Spice Melange right before her death. The children were pre-born and awakened to a level of consciousness which meant that they were born as fully developed and matured human beings in the bodies of infants. Chani had been given contraception by Paul Atreides' lawfully wedded wife, Irlen Carino, and the drugs had caused complications during childbirth that proved fatal. Leto's birth caught everyone off guard, whereas Paul had expected Ganima to arrive because of his prescient visions. Leto, however, was not prescient like his father, Paul, but he sensed the responsibility that came with the terrible power that prescience brought. After Paul abandoned his responsibilities, Leto felt it was his own duty to face the same trial. Following the death of Chani and Paul's disappearance, in the unforgiving Arakeen Desert, the twins were raised by their aunt, Alia. In the meantime, Paul's sister Alia served as regent of the Imperium he had established. Alia was also preborn and fell victim of the potential effects of spice. Her body was taken over by the vengeful Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, who held a deep-seated hatred for the Atreides. She plotted to eliminate Leto and Ganima and spark a violent uprising to dismantle the Imperium. But Leto and Ganima had devised their own strategy to overcome the challenges of of their pre-born status. Leto created a personality comprised of his ancestors, each possessing him to prevent any one of them from controlling him. And as Leto and Ganima grew older, their powers began to emerge and they became aware of the dangers that surrounded them. It was Lady Jessica, their paternal grandmother, who came to their aid, sensing their untapped potential and recognizing the peril that they were in. Because of her ties with a lot of Fremen, Jessica worked tirelessly to protect the twins from harm. But the real threat to their safety came from within. In. Leto's powers of precognition allowed him to see the golden path, but unlike Paul, he understood the terrible cost of the path he must take to avoid humanity's doom. He knew that he would have to become a sandworm and take on the burden of prescience, transforming himself into a being that would live for thousands of years, carrying the memories of all his ancestors and becoming the ultimate protector of humanity. After House Carino attempted to kill Leto, he and Ganima were forced to separate to ensure their survival. Leto retreated to the remote corners of the desert, where he used his time in isolation to build up his knowledge and power. It was during this time of solitude that Leto underwent a radical transformation, merging with the sand trout of the desert and becoming a hybrid of humans and sandworms. Meanwhile, Ganima was asked to convince herself that Leto had died, and this illusion created a sanctuary for her identity to flourish, with Chani's spirit serving as her guardian. How did Leto transform into a human sandworm hybrid? Leto had always known that he would have to undergo a radical transformation if he was to fulfill his father's legacy and preserve humanity's future. He had spent years studying the Golden Path, the path of survival that his father had seen in his prescient visions. He knew that he had to become something more than human, something that could endure the ages to come. And so it was that Leto found himself in the desert, surrounded by sand trout, the first stage of the giant sandworms that roamed the dunes of Arrakis. He had studied them, learned from them, and now he was ready to become one of them. He reached out his hand, and a sand trout squirmed onto it, stretching and elongating until it covered his entire palm. Leto checked his enzyme balance, drawing on the knowledge of countless lifetimes to ensure that he did not succumb to a spice overdose. He felt the sand trout merging with him, feeding on him even as he fed on it. Another joined the first, and then another, until they covered him up to his elbow. They merged together, 
forming a single living membrane that pulsed with the beat of his heart. As Leto merged with the Sand Trout, he sensed a transformation taking place within him. His body was becoming more resilient and formidable. As the creatures melted with his flesh, he felt their presence all around him, and his skin no longer seemed like his own. It was an unusual feeling, but he understood that it was necessary for what was next to happen. And then it finally happened. Leto let himself become something new and terrible. He was no longer human, no longer even a sand trout. He was a sand worm, a towering colossus that stretched across the desert, consuming everything in its path. But even as Leto became the creature that would be known as the God Emperor. He kept his face. It was a small concession to his humanity, a reminder that he had not lost everything in his transformation. And as he looked out across the street, he knew that he had become something greater than he had ever imagined possible. He was the Sandworm, the God Emperor, and the future of humanity. The journey of becoming an emperor and the years of his reign. Leto became the fearsome god emperor of Dune. He was absolutely indestructible now. Nothing could destroy him now, except, of course, water, which was his only secret weakness, something that would eventually lead to his death. But let's not cut to the chase, shall we? Because there's a lot that happened in 3,500 years of his reign. Leto Atreides II returned to the dusty city of Arakeen after his transformation into a hybrid human sandworm and defeated the possessed Aaliyah to claim the title of Padisa Empire. He also married his sister, Ganima, for legal reasons to consolidate his power. Thanks to Leto, Arakeen was a completely transformed planet now, complete with the beautiful river that was named after Duncan Idaho, the great sword master of the Dune universe. During the early years of his rule, Leto served as the commander for the Royal Guard, and he ordered a Gola of Duncan Idaho. To those who weren't familiar with the extensive lore of Dune, Golas were basically clones made by the Beni Tleilax from the cells of dead individuals. The Tleilax was a secretive patriarchal order of genetically modified humans. To put it in simple terms, they were known as the Masters of Genetic Engineering, who were able to manipulate the DNAs of dead individuals to create clones with their memories intact. Their ultimate goal was to achieve immortality through the creation of these Golas. These cells from dead individuals were placed in the wombs of women who were in a dormant and vegetative state, known as axolotl tanks. Almost every important character in the Dune universe gets created as a Gola, because that is the only way for them to ensure that the thinking machines don't take over humanity. The Tlialax's biggest breakthrough was when they stupefied a Gola of Duncan Idaho to Paul Muad'Dib, the new emperor of the universe. They had hoped by doing so, they would be able to finally figure out how to restore a Gola's memories. But their plan backfired when the Gola, named Hate, was reawakened and attempted to kill Paul. The Tlialax had not anticipated that the Gola would remember his past life, and it was only through the invention of Bejaz, a Talialex master who had been grown in the same axolotl tank as the Gola, that Duncan Idaho's memories were restored. Bejaz had been instrumental in reawakening Duncan's memories, and he was killed by the Gola he had helped create. Despite this, they had succeeded in renewing the flesh and memories of a Gola, which gave them a form of immortality. They kept this power confined to a single government, and they were careful not to let it be demanded everywhere. Skytail, the face dancer who made this new eternal life possible, was brought back to life and promoted to Talialex Master. He used the existing Saudakar and Fremen troops to enforce his rule, commanding them through a series of Idaho Golas. Leto banned the training of Mentats and suppressed the ancient order of Mentats as they posed a potential threat to his rule. Leto established a brand new all-female army known as the Fish Speakers, led by a number of Duncan Idahos. As his empire expanded and he needed a dependable religious organization to uphold his peace and guarantee the progression of the Golden Path, the Fish Speakers were known to be the most successful military force ever to exist. The Nine Historians' anticipation and subsequent burning of the pyres of their published works was one of the most famous occurrences that took place during Leto's rule, but it was very poetic in the sense that they all passed away gently, but none of them felt the fire. Leto repressed Wallach Nine, because that is where Benny Gesserit believed the Mentats school had hidden, and to carry out his order-wide prohibition, Leto dispatched Duncan to burn down the school. Nevertheless, some of the sisters escaped from the school by concealing their identities, and later they continued to serve the sisterhood. The arrival of the Bene Gesserit sisters in the 3,507th year of Leto's rule on Arrakis was a significant occasion in the history of the planet. Their objective, which required both expertise and diplomacy, was to confirm the Nine Historians' execution, which was widely believed to have occurred 
occurred, particularly Sister Chinoa, who was chosen to go with Leto and the fish speakers on a very long and uncommon journey, and that proved to be a significant addition to the mission. Sister Chinoa was given a unique opportunity to meet with the God Emperor during her tour, which was an honor that very few people could ever aspire to receive. She had a talk with Leto as she followed the royal cart that would permanently change the way she saw the world. She was told by Leto that he wanted to re-establish the outside vision, which was something that held a lot of significance for the sisterhood. But Leto did not stop there. He also shared with Sister Chinoa his innermost thoughts on what the future held for both himself and the sisterhood. He knew that his time was limited, and he wanted to make sure that his legacy would endure long after his death. He also predicted that she would never become a reverend mother. Sadly, Leto was correct. Due to the incompatibility of the melange, Sister Chinoa died during the spice agony, leaving behind a legacy that would be remembered by the sisterhood for a very long time. Her encounter with the God Emperor had been brief, but its impact was immeasurable. For Sister Chinoa, it had been a moment of enlightenment and revelation, a glimpse into the mind of one of the most powerful beings in the universe. And for the sisterhood, it was a reminder of the importance of humility, foresight, and wisdom in a world where power and ambition often lead to ruin. Assassination Attempts on Leto Explored Leto's life was marked by numerous attempts on his life. The final failed assassination attempt was carried out by an Idaho Gola who tried to kill him using a las gun. After this failed attempt, Leto spared his life but ordered the ambassador to leave Arrakis forever. Leto also planted the Atreides DNA for subsequent generations because he knew and he understood very well that his reign had to come to an end for advancement to continue. While Leto was traveling the Idaho River, the Beni Talilak was after him. Face dancers approached the group, first appearing as Museum Fremen and then transforming into a replica of Duncan. The objective was to destroy the God Emperor by confusing the fish speakers so they wouldn't know which Duncan to obey. After this failed attempt, Leto publicly punished the Talilax ambassador and evicted him. Othwa Yaik had also warned them of an impending assassination by the Talilax. Unfortunately, their message reached the captain of the fish speaker guard after the assassination attempt had already failed because he refused to believe them. Although Antiak and Loisio managed to meet with Leto, they only secured a promise that the spice allotment of the sisterhood would remain unchanged for the next ten years, despite the sisters' further attempts to assassinate him using spice essence. The Talilax participated in a final and direct assassination attempt against Leto in the festival city of On, formerly Arkeen, and engineered an Ixian ambassador called Wee Nori, who was a female clone from the cells of his old friend Malki. Wee's birth and upbringing outside Leto's precognitive powers meant that he was unaware of of her existence until she was offered as an envoy. As Leto got to know Nori, he fell in love with her, and a few months later he proposed to her, even choosing the wedding date himself. However, when Leto announced his marriage to Wee, he called her uncle Malki to Arrakis for a small conversation before having him executed by Moneo. How was he finally killed? Leto was fully aware that his time was running out, but he tried to hide it during his journey to Tuano. As Leto arrived at Tuano, he was filled with the sense of dread. He knew what was coming and had made his peace with it, but that didn't make it any less daunting. It was then that we, his beloved companion, approached him with a request. She made a heartfelt request for Leto to unite their souls because she realized that their physical separation would soon make interaction impossible due to Leto's transformation. Leto was moved to tears by her selfless love Love and deep empathy. She understood the true altruism of his actions and the ultimate sacrifice that he would have to make. For the first time in what felt like an eternity, he experienced true happiness, a feeling he had long abandoned hope of ever feeling again. The royal peregrination seemed ordinary on the surface, but both Siona and Duncan were ready for rebellion. They knew Leto's plan to breed them and were determined to fight against it. Siona had power over Nyla, who was Leto's pet fish speaker and used it to plot against Leto. At the Sarir's Guardian Wall, Nyla suddenly fired a last gun at the bridge, destroying it just as Leto and Wee were crossing. The explosion caused the sand trout to lock up the water in their bodies, leading to the reappearance of sandworms, each containing a pearl of Leto's consciousness and adaptability. In the aftermath of Leto II's reign, the universe underwent a dramatic transformation. Leto's tactics were both draconian and monopolistic, leading to the destruction or weakening of many of the established power brokers in the galaxy. Leto was a divisive figure. His followers considered him a deity, while the Bene Gesserit considered him a tyrant and absolutely loathed him. The Tlialax, however, continued to spread throughout the cosmos in the scattering, just like the rest of humanity, in an attempt to find more hospitable worlds. Despite their success in creating Golas, 
The Talialex were still searching for new ways to achieve immortality, and as they journeyed into the unknown depths of space and remained a powerful and mysterious force who were feared by many. After Leto's death, a new religion emerged on Rakiz called the Holy Triumvirate of Heaven, which was made up of Leto, Lady Jessica, and his father Muad'Dib. According to the Rakiz priests, Leto possessed the spirit of his sibling Leto II the Elder. When the Honored Matress attacked Rakiz, the religion continued to thrive. Those who had survived the scattering and returned to the old empire referred to Leto as Guldur, which translates to Great God of Darkness. After Leto's death, there was a widely held belief that his spirit lived on within the sandworms that grew on Arrakis. This belief was confirmed when a young woman named Sheena gained control over the worms and went on to become Benny Gesserit's youngest reverend mother, and it was rumored that she carried a pearl of Leto's consciousness with her. Despite the controversy surrounding Leto's reign, his impact on the universe was undeniable. His rule transformed the galaxies in ways that were both positive and negative, leaving behind a legacy that continued to influence the course of history long after his death. What made him so powerful? Leto Atreides II was a remarkable character with an exceptional set of abilities. His physical prowess was impressive as his mental abilities. Covered entirely by a sand trout membrane, Leto was a unique mutant with outstanding physical abilities. He possessed superhuman strength and could leap great heights and distances with ease. However, his abilities didn't stop there. As a part of his golden path, Leto allowed numerous sand trout to attach themselves to his body, which transformed him into a giant sandworm as we know now, and the sand trout acted as a second skin, providing him with unmatched speed and power. Leto's true identity as the Kwisatz Haderach allowed him to absorb the remarkable abilities of a sandworm, making him almost invincible. With his combined powers, Leto became a godlike figure, forever altering the course of history in the Dune universe. Leto also appeared in the 2003 miniseries. As James McAvoy brought Leto to Atreides to life in the 2003 miniseries adaption of Children of Dune, he was faced with the challenge of portraying a character that undergoes a tremendous transformation throughout the course of the story. While Leto is initially portrayed as a young child in the novel, the decision to age him and his twin sister Ganema to their teenage years for the miniseries allowed McAvoy to delve deeper into the complexities of the character. McAvoy's portrayal of Leto was made with widespread acclaim, lauded for his uncanny ability to capture the elusive essence that characterizes the conflicted and enigmatic character. Critics marveled at the delicate balance he struck between a brooding intensity and a playful mischievousness, bringing Leto to life with a nuance and depth rarely seen in such a complex role. But it was his chemistry with co-star Jessica Brooks, as Ganema, that was truly complex and notable throughout the series. In portraying Leto, McAvoy was able to convey the character's dichotomous nature. He is both revered and feared by those around him. Leto is a figure of immense power, but also one who is plagued by inner turmoil as he struggles to navigate the difficult path he has chosen for himself. McAvoy's nuanced portrayal of the character allowed viewers to truly emphasize with Leto's plight and understand the motivations behind his actions. All in all, McAvoy's performance as Leto was a highlight of the miniseries, cementing the character's place as one of the most complex and intriguing figures in science fiction. The story of Leto Atreides II is more of a cautionary tale about the dangers of unbridled power and the need for balance in the universe. Leto's incredible physical and mental abilities allowed him to become a godlike figure, but at a great cost. In his quest to create a better world, he ultimately sacrificed his own humanity and became something else entirely. Just like in our modern lives, there will always be forces beyond our control that we must learn to navigate. Technology, for example, has brought about immense benefits, but also poses significant challenges. We cannot compete with it, yet we cannot live without it. Thus, striking a balance between the use of technology and its potential impact on our lives is crucial. We hope you enjoyed today's video. We'll be back with another video about your favorite science fiction franchises very soon. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, and be safe. Thanks, everyone. Everyone.